Ephesians 2 verse 2. Wherein in times past, times past in the history before, you, he's talking to the Ephesians, walked according to the courses of this world. You, you walked in the worldly causes, not in Yahuwah's way. You walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Because the way of God is obedience. Yeshua is the way. Your word, your Torah is a lamp to my feet and a, power and a um, light to my way. So Israel is supposed to be obedient to their God. But because Israel was disobedient, Israel got scattered into the world and became um, as part of the Gentile world, walked according to the Gentile idolatries under the prince of the power of the wickedness of uh, the kingdom of darkness. So Paul is saying to the Ephesians, in times past, you were these people of disobedience. The house of Israel broke away from the Torah and they were scattered within the Gentile world who were disobedient and who still are disobedient. That's why I agree with the Jewish rabbis. The regathering and the restoration of the kingdom of Israel is not complete yet. But I don't agree with him because it has started already. Because Paul says in Ephesians 1 verse 4, According as he has chosen us, the Gentiles, in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, he has predestined us unto the adoption of children, adopting Gentiles into the house of God's kingdom with his own children to become part of that house, not some new house somewhere in the New Testament, but according to Yeshua himself, according to the good pleasure of Yeshua the Messiah. We, we as Gentiles who don't even knew that we are supposed to be part of Israel, once we turn back to him in obedience, then we are adopted into his house. And that's why he then says he can give all the nations as an inheritance to his son, Yeshua. Therefore, Paul continues in Ephesians 2 verse 11. Wherefore, remember that you being in times past, you were Gentiles in the flesh. You know, in times past, Gentiles, flesh, see Romans 7 to understand what it means to be free from the law of the flesh so that you can do the law of God. And all of us, Ephesians, we in times past, up to now, we were in the Gentile nations. And at that time, we were without Mashiach. And these times in the past, when we were Gentiles in the flesh, we Gentiles were without Mashiach the Mashiach of the Bible. We were aliens or strangers. And here you need to see Isaiah 56 as well, where the Old Testament says, don't let the son of the stranger who decided to join himself to Yahuwah, he mustn't say, Yahuwah have separated me from his people. Because as the prophet Isaiah and Paul says, when we as Gentiles who were without Mashiach, are gathered back by Mashiach, we become part of God's people. We will be his people and he will be our God. Being aliens, um, if, um, Ephesians, Paul continues, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, you know, Israel, God's people, and strangers from the covenant of promise, just like um, uh, Isaiah says, the son of the stranger who were a stranger to the covenants of promise, um, the covenant of promise to Adam, to Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. We were strangers. We didn't understand this in the past. We were, you know, doing another religion. We didn't take part in the covenant of the Old Testament, right? So we were aliens and strangers because there's only one covenant from the beginning. But we, as aliens to the commonwealth of Israel, Paul says, 
The commonwealth of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, is what God's kingdom is about. And for the Ephesians who are aliens and strangers to that covenant and to that commonwealth, we had no hope because we were without God in the world. But now, finally, the prophesied Messiah, Moshiach Yeshua, through him, you who were sometimes far, far away, you who were strangers, you who were aliens, you are now made near, you are uh, gathered back together by the blood of Messiah. And that's why the blood of Messiah is called atonement blood. And, be, uh, and that atonement blood makes one the two kingdoms of God. The one is called the house of Judah, the Jews. The other one is called the lost sheep from the house of Israel. And those are scattered within the Gentile nations. So one new man, remember, one king over one nation, one new man, one kingdom, one God. But the blood of Messiah, and this has always been prophesied since the beginning, for this Messiah is our peace. He has made both one. And he has broken down the middle wall of partitioning between us. The wall between these two brothers. What is this wall? Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself, in Yeshua, a one new man, so making peace. What is he breaking down? This law of commandments that's contained in ordinances. Yes, I know people say that's the Torah. So that's just funny how Moshiach is sent and he said not to abolish the law, but to enlighten you about the law, to bring the law to fulfillment, to full understanding. So in one place he says he comes not to abolish. And then people say, Paul says, yeah, he came to abolish. No, this law of commandments contained in ordinances, that is the partitioning wall, Ugh, the middle wall of partitioning between Jew and Gentile. That middle wall must be broken down. And that is not the law of God. Because the law of God is Yeshua that became flesh. So Yeshua will make one new man, bringing peace between Jew and Gentile, so that he might reconcile or restore both, both what? The house of Judah and the house of Israel unto God, because everything must be restored back to God. The Bible says clearly, even in 1 Corinthians 15, once Yeshua has got everything under his control, he will he will offer it back to the Father so that God can be all in all. So Yeshua will reconcile the house of Judah and the house of Israel both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you who were far off the house of Israel who is scattered into every tribe, nation, tongue, and country far away from Jerusalem, and to them that are near the house of Judah, who lived in Jerusalem, who went to exile, came back to Jerusalem, were then scattered after the Romans burned Jerusalem in 70 AD, and has returned back again to Jerusalem. So those who are near to Jerusalem, those who are far away from Jerusalem, Yeshua makes one. How many times did he say, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times did I want to bring you all back under my wings like a mother hen does with her chickens? Because that's the work of Messiah, especially with his second coming, when this will be finally fulfilled and he can gather all his chickens under his wings like a mother hen. For through Yeshua, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit unto the Father. Yes, I know people tell me the spirit, the Ruach, was only given in uh, the book of Acts. That is total hogwash. You can read about the spirit of God on almost every page of the Old Testament. I mean, you read about the spirit of God in Genesis 1 verse 2. So this is the same spirit, the same breath of God with which he created Adam. 
It has never changed. And that spirit is accessible to those people that is willing to listen to the words that is spoken by the breath of God. And the word spoken by the mouth of God um, is carried out of the mouth of God by His Spirit, by His breath. Because Ruach in, in Hebrew means breath. Therefore, you are no more strangers now that you are brought closer by Moshiach. You are not foreigners, but now you become fellow citizens. Fellow citizens of the New Testament church? No. The household of God. The, where is that, where is that now? The commonwealth of Israel. The covenants of promise made to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. God's people. Don't let the son of the stranger say that because I am far away and without Moshiach, because I'm Gentile, I am not part of your people. I'm separated from your people. No. God separated the house of Israel from the house of Judah and scattered them into all the world. But now if we understand the commonwealth of Israel and we start believing the covenant of promise, then we have hope. And through Moshiach, the living Torah, through his atonement, we are made near, made near to come back to the commonwealth of Israel, the uh, people of God, to be made one new man, be reconciled together with the house of Judah, so that we can be adopted into the family of God, together with all the saints. Which saints? Well, all the people that have died in the Old Testament that was part of Israel. So we become one in the household of God. And we'll get to the prodigal son. And the prodigal son is a beautiful picture of how both the older and younger brother, the one was far away, remember, in the pigsty. The one was near, he stayed home. And there was a dividing wall. There was a wall of division between the two brothers and only Messiah can break down that wall. Now, you will say the Torah is the dividing wall between the two houses. That's what every Tom, Dick and Harry tells me when they uh, bring up this verse and say, no, we don't have to keep the Torah. The Torah is for the house of Judah only. And uh, let me tell you something, Christian pastors, um, the Jewish rabbis agree with you. They also say the Torah is for us, the Jews alone. You dogs, you Gentiles, you are only defiling the holy law of God. You're not allowed to keep it. But that's what we learned in church, and that's what the Jewish rabbis are teaching, that the Torah is the dividing wall between the two houses. Remember, Yeshua said, He will break down the dividing wall. Now, let's see. If Yeshua is the living Torah, the word that became flesh, then Yeshua is the middle wall that separates us from the house of Judah. Really? Do you believe even that? If obedience to the Torah and repentance because of our law breaking is what separated us in the first place, how on earth can the same Torah, if we obey it, still be the separating wall between us? That's absolutely ridiculous. The, the breaking, the disobedience of Torah, God says, my arm is not too short to help you. It is your sin, your disregard, your rebellion against my voice that has built a wall between you and me. That is the wall that was built between us and God. Mashiach breaks down that wall through his atonement blood. How can the sin breaking of Torah that built the wall how can that same Torah also be the wall? The breaking of the Torah is the wall. And there's also another um, uh, partitioning wall between Jew and Gentile. What is the middle wall of partition? This wall that's put there by the law of con commandments that's contained in ordinances. Christians say it's the law of God. So only God has a law of commandments and ordinances, right? Nobody else has law and commandments and ordinances. Let's have a look at the middle wall first. The middle wall is not the Torah, but the man-made partitions 
that the Jews illegally added to the temple, separating the outer court into subdivisions, including the so-called court of the Gentiles. This is a man-made separating wall between the Jews that's allowed in the temple and the Gentiles that is not allowed in the temple. Even the separating of men and women in the temple that is ordained, it's, it's in the ordinances of the Pharisees. Because if, if you look at the um, synagogues and the temples and the, even the wailing wall today, women over there, men over here. You know, this is a man-made ordinance. This separation wall did not exist in the wilderness tabernacle or in Solomon's temple and definitely does not exist in the heavenly temple. This man-made partition between the house of Israel, Ephraim that is scattered in the Gentile nations, and the house of Judah is what Yeshua came to abolish, not the Torah. He says in Matthew 5 verse 17, don't, don't you say I came to abolish the Torah. Who are you to say that I came to abolish the Torah? No, he didn't come to abolish the Torah. The Torah is not the, 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 uh, the middle dividing wall. It is then in the Torah that the scattering and the regathering of Ephraim in the gentle nations is prophesied. The temple was supposed to be the house of prayer for all nations. Look at Old Testament, Isaiah 56, 11, New Testament, Mark 11, verse 17. The house of prayer for all nations. That is God and Messiah's plan from the beginning. And that's why the disciples asked him, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel so that your temple again can be called a house of prayer for all nations? So this dividing wall that we see today in um, the Jewish synagogues and, the, and uh, even if they're going to put up a temple sometimes, and you can also see that in Yeshua's time, there was this dividing wall between the Gentiles and the Jews. But remember what we, what we read in Isaiah, where God said through the prophet Isaiah, the son of the stranger who wishes to join himself to me, can actually now be part of my people. When you turn to me out of any Gentile pagan nation, then you become part of my people. I'll show you the other verses as well, where the prophets, um, God talks through the prophets and say that, that any stranger who keeps the Sabbath of God will actually become a, a pillar inside the temple of God. But the Jewish people have made a division wall between Jews and Gentiles. Oh, Gentiles are not allowed in the temple. I agree. The Bible, the Torah also says Gentiles are not allowed in the temple. But a Gentile that, like Ruth, says, your God is now my God and your people is now my people. That Gentile becomes part of Israel and then he can come into the temple. And that's the abolishing that Yeshua came to do, to break that wall between the older brother Judah that is so angry towards the younger brother and so jealous and doesn't want to allow him to come back into the house. And also the division between men and women. You can if, read through all the Old Testament, show me one place where men and women were separate. God called um, all the people together and he said, bring your wife and your children and the strangers that are with you and gather together. And even after the Babylonian exile, you can see Ezra and Yemiah calling the, the men and the women and the children to come together and, and, and be the gathering so that they can read the Torah to them. And they stood there in the rain the whole day long while Ezra was reading from the Torah to them when they were rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. All right, so I, I've said quite a quite a lot and to be quite honest that all was only the introduction let's start at the beginning of the bible so that i can show you from the beginning what god says who is israel and then everybody else jew and christian and rabbi and pastor and white israel and black israel and european jews and uh you know, 
only Jews can be in Europe. No, only Jews can be in Ethiopia. Or, you know, everybody has a claim. Everybody must stop claiming that they are Israel. We need to look at what God says who Israel is. I do have um, a lot of the black Israelis who criticize Two Trees Ministry on Facebook. The white Israel vision who criticizes Two Trees on Facebook. The Christians criticize Two Trees on Facebook. And the Jews criticize Two, street, <laughs> two Trees in the streets of Jerusalem. But with, with this study, we are going to ask the questions. What does God say? Who is Israel? Who is Judah? Who is um, Hebrew? Who are the house of Israel and who is the house of Judah? Who are the Jews? Where in scripture was the house of Judah first called Jew? What is diaspora? Scattering. What is Aliyah? Regathering. Who is the good shepherd? You know, the one that came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who is this good shepherd out of the Old Testament prophesied? Must we follow the law and the prophets to be Israel? So these nine questions, I will give you the, I will show you the answers out of scripture. And then it's going to be up to you. You will have to make up your own mind. I can only show you. Right. Who is Israel? What does God say? I'm not interested in a human opinion because both Jews and Christians does not really want to accept what God says. And here I would like to show you a short clip of the argument, uh, almost three hour argument we had with a Jewish rabbi in the streets of Jerusalem where they said, you know, we, only we are Israel. Only the Jews are Israel. That's not what the Bible says. And I tried to show him. I quoted for him scripture after scripture. And the more scripture I quoted, the more angry he became. And let me be honest, it's the same with the Christians. The more scripture I quote to them to prove this point out of scripture, the angrier they get. So then eventually I just don't quote scripture to them anymore. And I ask them to quote scripture to me. And then what do they have to quote? then it becomes such a difficult position because you don't want to um, distance people from yourself. You want to draw them to Messiah. But if somebody is not willing to look at scripture, then you know what? What now? God says, I will leave you up to the idol that's inside your heart. So if you want to follow the idol in your heart, if you, if you want to follow the, the kingdom that you've got set up in your heart because of your church and your family and your culture and your history, and you don't want to look through the glasses of scripture at possible deception and lies in that history, you know, then that's up to you. I don't want to argue with you. Definitely not. Evolution is too complex for you to give this garbage about the watchmaker and the watch. But no. you can't prove. The biggest joke. But you, but you cannot you prove. The you cannot prove the existence well, of God. No, okay. Dude, oh, God says in, in me, Torah, well, I am in your body. I am going to go and sit there. we go and sit there? God the doesn't say that. Actually, it's actually, God says. Uh, God right. actually says directly that my He's not ruach, found. My ruach is in you. Can I just quickly? Ruach does not mean God. What is your name? My name is Rabbi Dalad. No, we're not touching him. Can we go and sit there? You can't sit there. God is not in any part of creation at all. That's a fundamental of of of, uh, of of the of the of the of the Torah. You yeah. see, anybody? How do you, how do you mean? You say it's not part of creation now. Because it says, "I will call my name <laughs> upon you." That's directly from the text. So it- that was just a short expert. We were actually really there for almost three hours, and it was extremely difficult. I tried to tell him, 
you are the house of Judah. You are what is prophesied in the prophet Ezekiel, 10 men from the 10 northern lost tribes will grab onto the, the, the tzitzit, the border, the seam, the clothes, the garments of a Jew. Yeshua was a Jew. He was from your tribe. But we, we didn't even touch on Yeshua. We just tried to, to show to him the fact that Gentiles are coming back to the Torah of the God of creation. is a proof that all the prophecies in the Old Testament is coming true. But he didn't want to hear nothing of it. All right, so the question is, who is Israel? This is the big question. So let's first look at Israel from the beginning. The seed of Abraham, the covenant with Abraham. Genesis 22, that in blessing I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply your seed as the sand that is upon the seashore. And where is the seashore? All over the earth. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Why? Because your seed will be in all the nations of the earth. Because you have obeyed my voice. And that's why that song we sang when we were young, remember? Father Abraham has many sons, many sons as Father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord right arm, Father Abraham. So that is a very prophetic song. Yes, if we teshuva, turn back to God, the God of the Bible, the God of covenant, we are the seed of Abraham that is in the nations of the earth. Genesis 28, your descendants, Abraham, will also be like the dust of the earth. Not only the dust in Jerusalem or in Israel, the land. No, all the dust of the earth. And listen, this is what is um, given to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. And you will spread out. This is the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the seed of Jacob, the seed of Israel, will spread out to the west and the east and the north and the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's why God, when the house of Israel became so totally idolatrous, God said in Hosea 1 verse 9, Then God said, Call his name Loami, for the house of Israel, I'm not putting this, this is not my words, look in your own Bible, for the house of Israel, God says, are not my people anymore. They will become Gentiles all over the earth, and I will not be your God anymore. Loami, no more my people will the house of Israel be. Yet, the number of the children of Israel, when the restoration finally happens between Judah and Israel, shall be as the sand of the sea, just as God promised Abraham. Remember when we looked at the 153 fish. Here where God said, They are not my people, lo ami. It shall be said in the last days, They are the sons of the living God, when they are regathered. And the gematria, the calculation of the numbers of that phrase, sons of the living God, is 153. Just like the fish that the disciples drew out that night. Deuteronomy 28 says, And you, Israel, shall be left few in number amongst the Gentile nations, whereas you were as the stars of heaven for a multitude. Why? Why does God scatter you into all the nations of the earth because you would not obey the voice of Yahuwah. So that's why the separation wall is the reason we were separated from God and from the kingdom of God. And, and the disobedience to the law is the separation, not the law, the disobedience to the law. So this shows to you, and I've got many more verses, but how long will this presentation be? But the original church, the kingdom of God, called Israel, is from Abraham's seed. And here God, already in the book of Genesis, prophesied 
that the seed will be spread all across the world. Right, next we're going to look at Jacob. Remember, Jacob is um, the man whose name was changed to Israel. And in Genesis, prophetically, the split between the two houses is already done. Genesis 32 verse 7. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he did what? He divided the people. His wife, his, his wives, he had four, and all 12 of his sons, um, the fathers of the 12 tribes. Yes, I know Benjamin at that stage wasn't there, but still the sons of Israel was divided into two bands, into two separate groups, right? Who was Jacob's wife? Who was Joseph's mother? Can you remember? Jacob's wife, his, his beloved wife, was Rebecca. Um, Achma, not Rebecca, Rachel. Jacob's favorite wife was Rachel, and she was the mother of Joseph. So Jeremiah 30 is all about the restoration of Israel and Judah. Remember now Joseph's mother. Remember the two groups that Jacob, Israel, divided his, his family into. Remember Joseph's mother is Rachel. Now, when you read Jeremiah 30, you will see for yourself it's all about the restoration of the house of Israel with the house of Judah so that God's kingdom can become one again. Now, what follows Jeremiah 30 is Jeremiah 31. And Jeremiah 31 is about the regathering of the lost children of Rachel. Remember Jacob's wife, Joseph's mother, Ephraim and Manasseh's grandmother. Her name was Rachel. Remember now, to keep, keep track, please. Jeremiah 30 is about the restoration of Israel and Judah. Jeremiah 31 is about the regathering of the lost children of Rachel. Who's that? Rachel's boy was Joseph. Joseph went to Egypt. He got Ephraim and Manasseh. They were totally divided or separated from the house of Jacob. For many years, for 20 years, remember. Jeremiah 31 verse 15, thus says Yahuwah, A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing, beat, bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children, because they are no more. Because they got scattered into all the world. Thus says Yahuwah, Hold back your voice from weeping, Rachel, and your eyes from tears, because your lost children, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, shall return from the land of the enemy, shall return from the land of the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the Assyrians, where the enemy of God's people is ruling as the sun god, false god, antichrist religions. I will bring them back. And there is an expectancy. Of course, like Paul said in Ephesians, our hope is a Messiah that will reunite us in the latter ends. There's an expectancy for your children in the latter end. Your children shall return to the country that I have promised to you and to Jacob. I have clearly heard Ephraim lamenting you have chastised me, and I was chastised like an untrained calf. This is now the children of um, children and grandchildren of, of Rachel. And here Ephraim finally comes to the point. The scattered lost sheep in the Gentile nations finally comes to the point where he says clearly, Turn back, and I shall turn back. Um, Ephraim says, I have been punished because I was an untrained calf. I didn't want you to train me. I didn't want you to teach me, God. I didn't want to be instructed. Torah is the Hebrew word for instructions. I didn't want to be instructed. The religion of today doesn't want to be instructed by the Torah. But Rachel, you can stop crying because although I have scattered them into all the earth and they've become lost when they admit their rebellion then i will tell them 
Ephraim, Gentiles, Israel scattered into the nations, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, turn back to me, says God, and I will turn to you. For you are Yahuwah, my Elohim. Ephraim, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the scattered ten northern tribes, the tribes of Joseph, must turn back to Yahuwah Elohim. This is the prophecy from Jacob all the way from Abraham down the line, down the history. Now we see where Jacob becomes Israel. Genesis 32, 28. And he said, Your name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. So the 12 sons of Jacob, the seed of Abraham and Isaac, became known as Israel, also called the house of Jacob. So whenever you read in the Bible about the house of Jacob, you know it's all 12 tribes. When you read about Israel, it's all 12 tribes. You will see clearly where in many places it talks about the house of Israel, like I showed you in Hosea 1 verse 9. Then you know that is the 10 northern tribes. And it talks clearly about the house of Judah. I'll show you. And those are the two southern tribes. So let's look at history further in Joseph versus his brothers, which is the house of Joseph, also called the house of Ephraim, also called the house of Israel versus the house of Judah. Please keep this in mind now. The house of Joseph, you'll find that in your Bible. But you also find that it's called the house of Ephraim. And then most of the times you'll find that it's called the house of Israel. Even Yeshua, remember, said, I've come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, Israel is led by the tribe of Ephraim. And Ephraim is the son of Joseph. And that's why the ten northern tribes were called house of Joseph, house of Ephraim, or house of Israel. And as Joseph versus his brothers, so the house of Joseph versus the house of Judah, which means the lost sheep in the Gentile nations versus the Jews. So Joseph, symbolizing the seed of Abraham that is hated by the other seed of Abraham, <coughs> Gentiles being hated by the Jews, and the Jews don't want them to keep the Torah, and we will see, see this very soon, when the New World Order comes into play and the Antichrist that will come out of the house of Judah will indeed bring the Noahide laws that they claim is in the Bible and they will force all the Gentile nations to keep the Noahide laws but the Gentile nations are not allowed to keep the Torah. So I, who keep the Torah, who keep the Sabbath days, who keep kosher, just like that rabbi in the streets of Jerusalem screamed at me, I have no right to keep the Torah. I'm hated. The, the, the seed of Joseph is hated by the seed of Judah. And just like Joseph got separated from his brother, brothers and he got absorbed into Egypt and he became unrecognizable to his brothers, that is symbolically prophesying the house of Joseph of which I am part of, is scattered into the heathen or the Egyptian nations. And his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, are thus used throughout Scripture as symbolic of the breaking away of the part of Israel that was scattered into the heathen nations. So understanding the biblical history really helps us so much so that we can understand why the house of Joseph is hated by the house of Judah. Why people today have such a great issue with being called Israel. Because all the promises, and like Paul said in Ephesians 2, all the covenants and all the promises are made for Israel alone, for nobody else. And that's why everybody wants to be Israel. But nobody wants to be the Israel that the Bible talks about. The Jews want to be Israel, only them. The Christians want to be Israel, but only them. And if you want to be part of Israel, you must become a Christian. And the Jews say, well, woman, if you want to become part of Israel, you must convert to Judaism. 
Man, Christianity and Judaism is not God's religions. None of those two are really the religion of Abraham or David or Yeshua or Paul or Peter. There's a huge difference. And if you don't know the difference by now, it's time that you start doing a Bible study. Joshua spoke unto the house in, in the book of Joshua 17 verse 17. Joshua spoke unto the house of Joseph. He spoke even to the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. So at that stage, this is the book of Joshua, many, many years before the actual split in the um, nation of Israel, Ephraim and Manasseh was already called the house of Joseph. And now in 1 Kings 11 verse 28, remember how I showed you here in 2 Kings 17 that Jeroboam was king over the 10 northern tribes, but he led Israel to sin against God by means of the idolatry. And later on, um, as we are going through the study now, we see that Solomon, before Jeroboam was made king, Solomon actually saw that this man was not too bad, you know. He was actually a very uh, mighty man of valor, 1 Kings eleven twenty eight, And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, because Jeroboam was a servant under Solomon, and then he served under Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And that's when he took half the kingdom. So Solomon saw the young man was industrious and he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. Now quickly I want to remind you of something. When God told Moses where each one of the tribes would live at the end of the day in the promised land, <clears throat> it was Judah and Benjamin that was living in the southern area and the ten other tribes got their inheritance more to the northern area. So even before the actual split in the kingdom of Israel, the house of Joseph, the ten northern tribes, was already towards the north, towards Samaria. And the house of Judah was already down to the south in Jerusalem. So here you can also see that the house of Joseph is not a, an unknown term in biblical prophecy. Look at Amos 5 verse 6. Seek Yahuwah and you will live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and he devoured it, and there is none to quench it. Because why? Here Amos is warning the house of Joseph, you know, the, the ten northern tribes, that because of their idolatry, because they are not seeking the Lord, but they are seeking their own ways, God will uh, break out against them like fire, and they're not going to like it. And if they don't turn back and seek Yahuwah and repent and return to him, they will be scattered. But first, their cities and their houses will be burned, their children will be killed, and they will be taken into captivity by the king of Assyria. Zechariah 10 verse 6, And I will strengthen the house of Judah. You see, in Zechariah, clear distinction between the two houses. And I will save Yeshua, the house of Joseph. And I will bring them again to this place. For I have mercy upon them. The New Testament preachers want to say, we live under grace, not under the law. And, you know, we as Messianics, who believe that we are in the process of becoming um, regathered as Israel again. We also believe that we are not under the law, that we are under grace. But there's a difference between being under the penalty of the law because of your sin and keeping the law because you love and fear and obey the God that forgave you your sin. And here we can see clearly all through the Old Testament, grace and mercy it's not just in Yeshua's time. God has always been the Yeshua. He's the Yeshua for the house of Joseph. He will have mercy upon them again. And he will, although he has cast them off, he will hear them if they call to him in repentance. Ezekiel 36 verse 17. Moreover, son of man, take thee one stick right upon it for Judah. For the children of Israel, you know, Judah, who is part of the children of Israel, 
Remember, the house of Jacob, the nation of Israel, is also called the children of Israel, and that is all 12 tribes. So Judah, of course, is part of the children of Israel. So on the one stick, um, God wants Ezekiel to write Judah. And they are part of the children of Israel, but Judah and his companions is to be written on the one stick. Then Ezekiel must take another stick and write upon it Joseph, because Joseph is represented by Ephraim. And then they are called the house of Israel. Do you see? Oh, do you see? <laughs> do you see? Here, children of Israel and Judah. Here, house of Israel. Oh, come on. Joseph, Ephraim, house of Israel, and his companions. What companions? My family, my friends, everyone that with me returns back to God. My companions and I. Although we look like Egyptians, sun god worship, we can be joined back together in the hand of God. The two sticks, just like the New Testament talks about the olive tree. Okay, Hosea 6 verse 10. I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is whoredom of Ephraim, and therefore Israel is defiled. So can you see, Ephraim is called, uh, uh, it's called the house of Israel. My two dogs want to fight here. Sit still, you little here. So God talks through the prophet Hosea, and Hosea was a prophet specifically for the house of Israel. That's why Hosea had to marry the prostitute. Because there's whoredom, there's prostitution with Ephraim. Rehoboam made them become whores by their idolatry. So clearly you can see now, Joseph is Ephraim, is the house of Israel, is the scattered people. They are separated, they are strangers, they are far off, and they are the Gentiles. And they are not my people anymore, God says in the book of Hosea. Yet, I remind you, that's where he says, But if they return to me, they will be my people again. And where they were called not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. The 153 fish. Genesis 42, 13. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brothers. And behold, the youngest, Benjamin, is this day with our father. And then there is one brother that is no longer with us. Here the brothers of Joseph um, were standing before this Egyptian leader. They didn't know it was Joseph. But here prophetically, the house of Joseph is called a house that no longer exists. Exactly like the Jewish rabbi told me in the streets of Jerusalem. Ephraim no longer exists. The house of Israel, the house of Joseph, no longer exists. They are dead. It's only the Jews that is part of Israel today. It's in, isn't that amazing? Just like Judah told Joseph here in Egypt. That's the same story Judah is still telling Joseph today. Ezekiel 11, son of man, your brothers, your relatives, your kinsmen, and all the house of Israel, <clears throat> all of it, are those about whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem, you know the Jews, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are the Jews, the house of Judah, they are saying about the house of Israel, let me just make sure that you are following me on this. My dogs are killing me. Sit no stall, you know, it's a belief. I just want to highlight something here. So here we have, I didn't want to do that. Here we have the house of Israel. All right. Does I? And here we have the inhabitants of Jerusalem that is the house of Judah. I just want to put them in another color. So clearly you can see now that the house of Judah is saying about the house of Israel. Although they are brothers, although they are relatives, although they are kinsmen, the Jews are saying to the Gentiles, to the 
pagans who want to return back to God and become grafted back into the Israel kingdom again. They are telling us, just like the rabbi told me in the streets, you keep far away from Yahuwah. This land has been given to us as a possession. That's exactly what the Jewish rabbi told me. And this is what God said through the prophet Ezekiel that the Jews will say. They will tell the Gentiles, you've got nothing to do with God. Keep away from him. He has given us, the Jews, this land. And his Torah is for us, the Jews. The Christians will be happy because they agree with that. The Torah is for the Jews. We don't want to keep the Torah. We like our pork and our bacon and our Christmas. The Jews have a hatred towards Ephraim. But the older brother's hatred to the prodigal son, the older brother's hatred towards Joseph, do you remember? Cain's hatred towards Abel. Ishmael's hatred towards Isaac. Esau's hatred towards Jacob. This is the prophetic cycles, the patterns, the teachings, the training that God is trying to give us through the prophets. We have always seen this fight between the two parts of the house of the kingdom of God, between the two brothers in God's household. Right, 2 Samuel 2 verse 4. And the men of Judah came, so here's the house of Judah, and they anointed David king over the house of Judah. Right? So you can see the house of Judah is also called the house of David. I've shown you that before as well. And here you can see that Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. But the house of Judah followed David. So clearly here you can see um, the son of Saul reigned over the 10 tribes of Israel, the house of Israel, and David ruled over the house of Judah. At that time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah, he was king for seven years and six months. Later on, he would also be crowned king over all of Israel, including the 10 northern tribes. And then he would reign 40 years altogether, right? But the first seven and a half years, interesting number, he was only king over the house of Judah. And that's why after David and after Solomon, um, the 10 northern tribes says um, in two kings, do you remember? Let us go away from the house of David because we no longer want to be under the yoke of Rehoboam. All right, Jeremiah 5.11. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, says Yahuwah. They, have, they are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers. They refused to hear my words, and they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah, I have, I have broken my covenant that I made with their fathers. As we go through the Bible study, you'll see that God eventually divorced the house of um, Israel because of their terrible prostitution. And although Judah also had prostitution, the Bible clearly, clearly, clearly says that God never divorced the house of Judah. I tried to tell this to the rabbi in the streets. He wanted to hear nothing of it. Isaiah 22, 21. And I'll clothe them with thy robe. I'll strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit thy government into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. This is, of course, prophetically um, talking about the, the governor, the ruler for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And you can see here, house of Judah, they stayed in Jerusalem. At the time when Yeshua came, it was the house of Judah that was in Jerusalem. At that stage, the house of Joseph was long gone scattered into every tribe, nation and tongue. And that's why Yeshua said, you know, my sheep is not of this fold. Uh, my sheep is the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And besides the house of Judah, I have the house of Israel I have to gather. Jeremiah 3.18 But in those days, the days of the Messiah, when he will do the restoration, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north, 
to the land that I have given unto them as an inheritance to their fathers. All right, the Jewish rabbi says this has already happened. The house of Israel are also called Jews today. And because in 1948, the state of Israel was formed, and now this prophecy has become true. Unfortunately, it is not so, because the rest of these prophecies talks about the kingdom of peace and where, the, where God's people will stay in safety. Is Israel safe today? Are there no bombs falling? Is there no World War Three being planned for the Holy Land? Is the Antichrist not going to sit in the temple and, and pretend to be God? No, this prophecy is not true yet, Jewish rabbi. All right, next, let's look at why the house of Israel was actually called the house of Ephraim. Why all these different names for the same group of people? Ephraim was the strongest tribe of the ten northern tribes. So the house of Israel, the ten northern tribes, is also called the house of Ephraim. Joshua spoke unto the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and to Manasseh, and he said, You are a great people, and you have great power. In the um, prophet Isaiah, within three scores and five years shall Ephraim be broken and no longer be a people. Remember Hosea 1, 9, where God said, Call the name of this boy Loami, for you, house of Israel, is not my people. Can you see how Hosea, Isaiah, Joshua, and all the other prophets agree on this matter. Isaiah 7, 9, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria. Now Samaria, if you look, up, look on your map, is towards the north of Jerusalem. And that's why they are called the northern ten tribes. And this is why it's so important to understand the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. And if you do the Two Trees Bible Studies Genesis session number 20, there's almost eight parts in session 20 that really explains to you the Samaritan woman at the well so that you can understand the house of Ephraim in Samaria. The Samaritan woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, the Canaanite woman that accepted that she was a dog in Matthew 15, the good Samaritan in Luke 10. Once you understand the house of Ephraim, the house of Israel, being the, um, the woman that God divorced, but that he wants back, is to now really understand what Yeshua was actually saying about these people and to these people. Because that's all prophetic for the rest of those who belong to, you know, what the Samaritan woman symbolizes and what the good Samaritan symbolizes. Because that Samaritan woman, as she was sitting there at the well and Yeshua told her, I am the Messiah. You were married so many times and now you're living like, you know, you're living in sin. We will get to all that. He was talking to the house of Israel. In the, in, the, in the area physically of Samaria. How beautiful and prophetic and historical is that for those who, who, who know how to do Bible study. Hosea 7 verse 8. Ephraim has mixed himself among the people. Among what people? The Gentile people. I know Ephraim and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you committed whoredom, and Israel is defiled. For Israel slides back as a backsliding haifa. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. That's why Joseph's brother said, um, Our one brother is no longer. He doesn't exist anymore. And here Ephraim is going to be divorced by God, scattered and forgotten about, forgotten about um, by the older brother Judah, forgotten about by all the world, but not forgotten about the, the king that knows his kingdom must still one day be restored. And that we can see throughout all the prophets. So leave es Ephraim, like God said to Adam and Eve, you know what, it's your choice. You either obey me 
or you disobey me. And if you want to disobey me, then I'll, I'll let you disobey me. Do whatever you want. I'm not going to force you to love me. But if you love me, God and Yeshua says, then keep my commandments. Judges 10 verse 8. In the year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. This was, remember, when we talk about the children of Israel, it's all 12 tribes. And these were the Philistines that were oppressing all 12 tribes. Moreover, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan to fight against Judah and against Benjamin. So here you can, you can see how um, in the book of Judges, there's already this distinction between the house of Judah, which consists of Judah and Benjamin, and the, Philist uh, the, the children of Ammon passed over the river to also fight against the house of Ephraim. So, <coughs> apologies. Here you've got Judah that consists of Judah and Benjamin, and here you've got the house of Ephraim, already in the book of Judges. So that all of Israel, all 12 tribes, were sorely distressed. So the Philistines and the Ammonites were already fighting against these two houses. And although these two houses wasn't physically divided yet, they lived in different regions. Judah and Benjamin lived in the south, and the house of Ephraim lived in the north, the other 10 tribes. So we've got the 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So the 12 tribes of Israel is Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Isashkar, Zebulon, and Benjamin. The priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. This we find in Deuteronomy 18 verse 1. So when you read through the Bible, you will sometimes find the 12 names like this, where Joseph counts as one, and Levi is also in this list. But then in other places, you'll find the, 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 the 12 names where Levi is no longer in the list. Why is that? Because the Levites were chosen to be the priests and to work and to stand in for all the kingdom of Israel before God. And therefore they had no inheritance physically in the land, but they were divided amongst all the tribes to serve them, to be priests for them before God. And then remember, Jacob blessed um, Joseph's two sons called the house of Joseph or the house of Ephraim or the house of Israel. So, when Joseph's two sons was brought into the picture, you will sometimes find these 12 names where the name of Joseph is totally missing. And Joseph is missing and Levi is missing. And those two names are then replaced by Ephraim and Manasseh. So as you read through both Old and New Testament, and you make a list of all the 12 names every time you see them, you'll either find Levi missing, replaced by Ephraim, or you'll find Levi in there, Joseph missing, and replaced by Ephraim, or both Joseph and Levi will be missing, and you'll find Ephraim and Manasseh in their place. But you know, whenever the Bible talks about Joseph, um, whether it's Joseph or Ephraim that's mentioned, it represents the house of Joseph. Levi is out most of the times because they never got a physical inheritance in the land. But then we see in the New Testament in the book of Revelation, because of Dan, and that's another Bible study that we don't have time for now, but because Dan is not included in Revelation in some of the 12, um, where the 12 names are mentioned. And there you'll find Levi again. Quite interesting. So Levi's exclusion from the inheritance formed the 12 tribes such as this. The 10 northern tribes is Reuben, Simeon, and of course Levi is not always mentioned, but half the tribe of Levi went with the 10 northern tribes to Samaria. The other half stayed um, with the two tribes in the southern area. So the 10 tribes was Reuben, Simeon, half the tribe of Levi, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulon, and Joseph. Those formed the northern tribes 
um, in Samaria. When Levi is left out in many places, then Joseph is replaced by his two sons representing him because J Jacob gave Joseph firstborn blessing to his two sons. So then the ten tribes can read like this. Reuben, Simeon, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Esashkar, Zebulon, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Those are the ten northern tribes in Samaria, plus half the tribe of Levi that lived with him. But they're not counted against them as a tribe because they didn't physically inherit land. So as you go through all scriptures, you can see the tribes are described like this for yourself. The two tribes, the house of Judah, is always described as Judah, Benjamin, and half the tribe of of Levi and this is the southern tribes the two southern tribes in Judea and that's why they were called Jews because they were living in Jerusalem in Judea and they were called the house of Judah and as people were saying that the uh, house of Judah from Judea eventually they became the Jews it was just a, a slang a way of saying that quicker so the house of David or the house of Judah is what we understand the Jews to be, even in the times of Yeshua. Because everyone thinks that when we read about Israel or the Jews in the New Testament, that those terrible Pharisees, they are Israel. They are the Jews. You know what? The Pharisees are the Pharisees, and yes, they were Jews. But the Bible also talks about the house of Judah, and it talks about the Jews from the synagogue of Satan. And you need to start understanding that difference as well. Because looking at our Jewish brothers and sisters today, yes, they treated me almost, I can just imagine how it was for Yeshua and the disciples when those Pharisees treated him that badly in the streets of Jerusalem. I was treated that badly in the streets of Jerusalem. And I don't think I even tasted 1% of what Yeshua and the disciples went through under the Pharisees. But that's not all Jews. Not all Jews are like that. So when we talk about the Jews from the synagogue of Satan, we are only talking about the serpent seed, the, the seed from Abram, Isaac, and Jacob that Satan stole as he stole Cain, Ishmael, Esau, as he stole the Jews from the synagogue of Satan who, who, comes, who comes out of God's own um, southern tribe. And he made them not only rulers of Israel, but in our day today, in the end days, these guys are rulers of all the banks and all the big corporations and all the pharmakia. So remember the question we asked? Let me just remind you of where we are. Why is the house of Israel called the house of Ephraim? I've shown you all these scriptures so you can try to understand. Now let's look at Jacob's blessing on Ephraim. I did show you that quite quickly in previous um, verses, but let's just quickly go through them again. Later on, of course, Ephraim, the actual tribe, became the leader of the house of Israel. And that's why house of Israel is also called house of Ephraim. Romans 11, 25. I do not wish you to be stupid about this. I don't want you to be ignorant about this, my brothers. Don't hide your head in the sand about this, my brothers. It is a secret. It's a secret. And I don't want you to be ignorant about this secret. So here, um, Paul, I can just hear him saying, my brothers in the church, my brothers in the synagogues, I don't want you to be ignorant of this secret, lest you think you are wise or clever in your own head, in your own estimation, lest you think more about yourself than you should. You need to understand this secret. What secret? That hardening in part has come over Israel, the house of Judah. Remember Ezekiel 37 calls both sides Israel. Ezekiel 37, right on the one stick, Judah, the house um, from, from um, the children of Israel. And on the other stick, you write Joseph um, from the house of Ephraim, from the house of Israel. Both of them are called Israel. That's not the problem. And here um, in Romans 11, where it specifically talks about the two sticks that must be grafted back into the olive tree. 
Paul is trying to tell us this big secret, the secret of all ages, is the regathering, the completeness of the nations, because the house of Israel is scattered into all the nations, and Abraham's seed that is scattered in the nations must come back out of the nations. And before that can happen, there must be hardening over Judah. The Jews must become hard so that the 12 disciples could go into all the world from Jerusalem to Judea, then to Samaria, and then to all the world to preach the gospel, the Bezora, the original covenant, and how Yeshua is the way back to the covenant. Because if hardening didn't come over um, this part of Israel, Judah, then the nations would not have time to come in. How can I be sure that the completeness of the nations means the house of Israel? Why? How can I be sure it's not just meaning, you know, the normal Gentiles out there? So remember now, Romans 11 says, the Jews will become hard in part, so that the completeness of the nations can come in. The complete nations can come in. I'm um, assuming, I'm, I'm trying to prove to you that Paul is talking about the house of Ephraim when he talks about the nations. And I'll prove this to you from scripture. So how can I know for sure? Because prophecy says so. Genesis 48 verse 19. Ephraim's seed shall become a multitude of nations. And the word multitude in Hebrew is mela, melo, and nations is goyim. So the multitude of nations is the fullness of the Gentiles. The melo ha goyim. The fullness, because melo means fullness, the multitude, how big they have become. And, and here in Genesis, in the beginning of the Bible, Ephraim is already called the fullness of the nations. So in jo Joseph, when Paul says the completeness of the nations must come in, he's saying that Ephraim's seed must come in. And therefore, there's a hardening over Judah. And this is the secret. And don't be stupid or ignorant or try to ignore the secret. Because it's on every page of the Bible. I've shown you how many scriptures already. Look at Romans 11 now again carefully. And it's this multitude of nations or this fullness of the Gentiles that has to come back and complete the prophecy and be restored with the older brothers who was blind to Joseph, remember? And their hearts were hardened against Joseph. Remember, go and read the story of Joseph and his brothers again in Genesis. And that's what Romans 11 is all about. The, because Romans 11 talks about um, partial blindness and partial hardening until Joseph comes back. Until Joseph and Judah is reconciled. Remember when the brothers went to Egypt? It was Judah that spoke to Joseph. It was Judah that eventually repented. And it was Judah that first, um, when Joseph revealed himself, he came and, and, he, and he hugged all his brothers. But Judah was first in line because Judah was standing in front, repenting of the sin of losing their brother and telling their father that their brother was dead.